All right, all right. You guys come in and grab a seat. Come in and grab a seat. <clears throat> I have to I have to tell you that <clears throat> last week I I knew that I probably wasn't supposed to say what I said last week, but I said anyway because I was so excited. But remember last week whenever I was telling you about how about Juice and Ashley and how they had found out that they were pregnant? Well, they're here this week, so they're back here. So make sure that you hug them and yeah, man, Woo! and 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 it's good. And I'm gonna tell you guys, this this is a very prophetic church, and so there's lots of words going already happening in these people for this baby, and so the Lord's gonna communicate those words to you as time goes on, and uh, there is an incredibly special plan for this baby. And so God knew exactly what he was doing. And it's, it's going to be an incredible thing. So we love you guys and we're celebrating. We're pumped for y'all. We're celebrating as a family with you. Now, <clears throat> I want to transition into something that Cinda and I were having a conversation this week about. And I was, I was just really stirred about this conversation. And I want to share it with you. Not only do I want to share it with you, but I'm going to ask you to participate in it with me if need be. We were talking about how, how Satan, is, Satan is so good at lying, how he's able to bring lies into our life and, and, uh, and rob things from us that is ours. Church, please understand this and don't ever miss this. Jesus came to bring us life and life to the full. The enemy, hear me say this, the enemy comes to steal kill and destroy every place in your life where you're experiencing lack problems difficulties now we go through trials we go through struggles but we go through them every place where you have camped in them and you're living in them is the place that God wants to move you out of so what is one of the things that prevents us from moving out of those things so much so I'm, I'm really quickly, this is like my mini sermon, but this one's really important to me and I want you to catch this. You hear people say, um, and, and, and I'm about to say to you, well, it's this person, man, they're struggling with the, with the spirit of, of whatever, a spirit of so many different things. Listen, when you, that's, that's a demonic thing. Satan has, demons are real. And, and Satan has these demons that speak to you and that affect you and that are doing everything they can to take you off of God's path for your life. So when you listen to that demonic realm, when you engage in that demonic realm, that's when you empower Satan in your life. When you deny him, you resist him, you, don't, you, you, you stop him from having power. But when you come into agreement with a lie, which is all that he speaks. All that he speaks is lies. When he speaks the truth, he's speaking a lie because he's trying to twist it. So when you come into agreement with the enemy, when you shake hands with him and you go, yeah, you know what? I am that. I accept that. I receive that. You have just empowered the enemy in your life. Please hear me say this. This is very important. When you do that, you will hear you will hear certainly hear me I'll, I'll tell you when we're talking because I I can struggle with these things you'll hear me say to you or someone say to you well you have a spirit of of uh, sickness or you have a, a spirit of poverty let me tell you something there are some incredibly filthy rich people that have a spirit of poverty having a spirit of poverty does not mean you don't have any money hear me having a spirit of poverty means you don't you're not able to experience to the full the things that the Lord provides for you when you have a spirit of poverty you have engaged with that demonic spirit and you are not possessed by him not if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior you cannot be possessed by him but listen to me 
scientifically, you know what a brain looks like. You know that, that gray matter and it's got all those ruts in it. Well, those ruts, we develop those ruts and we change those ruts. Those ruts are our thinking paths. And as we change our thinking, we can change the shape and the, and the, 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 um, the actual shape of our brain develops those new ruts. And so when you engage in the demonic realm and you hear him, yep, 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 and you come into agreement, you've changed your thinking into a polluted way of thinking, and that becomes your go-to. So when you think about those ruts in your brain, your thinking paths, think about being on a dirt, on a, on a dirt road after it's rained really bad. If you go up and down that dirt road in, on the same path, it's going to develop ruts. And if you allow those ruts to get deep enough, every time you go down that same dirt road, it just sucks you into that. You end up driving in the ruts that you're trying to get out of. The only way to change that is to fill those. And the only thing that has the power to fill those is the Holy Spirit. So listen to me. I'm going to tell you something now. I'm speaking to a room full of people that struggle with different spirits. I'm going to say all of these, and after I say all of these, if you've found, if you've heard Holy Spirit say, that's you in any of these, what I want you to do at the end is I want you to stand up, because we're going to pray for those, and we're going to leave those chains that have changed you to that laying on the ground for you to never walk in again. So what happens is we develop this, this uh, and, and just a few that the Lord had put on my heart. I heard the Lord say there's a tremendous amount of people that live in the spirit of poverty. So if you have that spirit of poverty, I want Holy Spirit to just stir that in you. Maybe you have a spirit of sickness, a spirit of, an, of iniquity. You just, you know that there's a sickness in your life. You've learned to just live with it. Not only you live with it, sometimes we, sometimes we take that sickness and we bedazzle it a little bit. We dress it up a little bit so that we can show other people. Because sometimes that sickness provides this, this thing that we're looking for. And maybe you don't realize it's sympathy. Maybe you do realize it. But whatever that, that spirit of iniquity that you've allowed yourself to accept, the Lord wants to remove that spirit of lust. No matter what you do, you just can't stop your eyes from going to that place. Let me tell you something. Men and women both. It's not, a, it's not just a little sin. The Lord God Almighty said it's adultery. To look at her with lust is adultery. And we've got to stop entertaining this and walk away from it. And then I also heard him say a spirit of doubt and a spirit of fear. When you live in a place of fear, you have come into agreement with the enemy. You are not walking in freedom, and you are living with a spirit of fear. And the Bible clearly says, I did not give you a spirit of fear, but of love and of a sound mind. And as you engage in those things, you start overcoming what robs you of fear. So, of all those things that I said, the Lord wants to break those off. And so we're going to pray right now. And if you, if, if, you, if you see any of those things in your life, I want you to stand up right now. I want to ask everybody to close your eyes, bow your heads. And if you identify with any of those things right now, you stand up. Because we're going to break those off right now in the name of Jesus. Stand up. Don't leave with that. Do not leave with that. Do not leave with that. Father God, I bring this body to you that I am standing in front of with them. We bring this body to you and we say, Lord God, these, these demonic mindsets, we are not possessed by the enemy. The enemy cannot possess us because the Spirit of God lives in us. But these mindsets the enemy has, has crafted in our life that have caused us to live in broken places, to drive down broken, ruddy roads, we break those right now in the name of Jesus. And we say to the demonic realm, you are dismissed. You have no authority in my life. I come out of agreement with every lie you've spoken over me. I am not what the enemy says I am, but Jesus, I am what you say I am. And Holy Spirit, come in and fill the ruts in every one of these places. 
so that we do not operate in these broken mindsets anymore. We release these broken ways and we're here to walk in the fullness of what you've given us. So God, the spirit of poverty is erased. You made us rich. The spirit of lust is erased. You've made us the righteousness of God. The spirit of sickness is removed. We are whole. You healed us on the cross. The spirit of doubt is removed. The spirit of fear, these are not ours to live in anymore. And Holy Spirit, we say, come into every, each and every one of these vessels, these houses, and fill us to overflowing so that the enemy has no more room to mess with us anymore. And we receive your wholeness and we walk in your wholeness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And at that, you ought to celebrate what the Lord just did in your life because he's good. He is so good. God is is so good to bring us to wholeness. Now the last few weeks I've been talking about where you pray from, how where you pray from determines where you live. I put a list up here on the board last week and most of you couldn't see it. You guys have that list up here? If not, I'll just I'll just explain it to you cuz I didn't even tell you guys, but where we, where, we, where we pray from determines where we live. Now, with all of that stuff I just said in mind, when you struggle with, with uh, I, can't, I can't ever seem to have enough. I can't ever seem to make it, or I can't ever seem to, to get this place. That's because you've found identity in these unworthy, unholy, dirty places. Whether it's unworthiness, unholiness, dirty, sinner, unclean, separate. I know if you've been here very long, I know you've seen and you've heard me say to you with emphasis because I I try to turn it down, but I can't. Listen to me. You are not some dirty, rotten sinner saved by grace. That ought to make all of you want to vomit to say when you're saved by grace, you're sanctified and set apart as the righteousness of God. Stop calling that some dirty, beat down, rotten sinner. That's not what you are. But when you identify from that, this is how you pray. God, I know I don't deserve. I'm, I'm broken and I, I'm sinful and I'm dirty and I'm, I can't seem to get. Get out of that. Stop that. Maybe you get off of, maybe if that's how you pray, get up off your knees and stand up and look at the Lord with some confidence and start to say, my God and Savior on the cross, you took my dirt, you took my shame, you took my poverty, you took my sickness, and now I stand before you as the righteousness of God. Fill me, Holy Spirit, so that I can live the life of destiny that you've called me to. I want to stop praying from this. And I want to recognize that you made me worthy. That you made me holy. That you made me righteous. That you made me pure. And that you have connected me. I'm not separate from you. I'm connected to you. Stop separating yourself from the King. When you gravitate, yeah, but man, yeah, but dead gum in our marriage, we just, we just what? We, we, we welcome, we celebrate the fact that we live in this broken place. Get out of it. I'm not saying it's easy, but invoke whatever help you need to invoke. Get out of it. Stop living in it. Stop living in a broken place in your job. Stop living in a broken place in your, in your whatever it is. You're the righteousness of God. And the Lord wants us to live in that. Because listen to me. If you don't know who you are, the people around you will never know either. I, I, I want to challenge the men in the room. You can't walk around and act like you're manly and pretend to be manly. And deny what God's made you to be. The family, the people that he's put you around deserve to experience the fullness of God through us. 
and we ought to stop giving our letting ourselves off the hook well well i just don't know enough scripture well i just don't pray like that i just don't hug like that i just don't okay but let yourself off of that hook that's broken because that hook is what satan is using to keep jacking you off of the path that god has for you stop accepting it and start walking in what he's made you to be because listen to me if you stay in that broken mindset if you always pray from that broken place and you never begin to pray from that place of victory you won't know what it's like to walk on the path of victory and if nothing else the people around you deserve better you deserve better but the people around you deserve better the problem is we have this struggle with this concept of me we know where we've been we know what we've done and we disqualify ourselves from what the king of kings has qualified us for who who in the world do you think you are man woman who do you think you are to disqualify yourself from what the king of kings has qualified you for you've got to begin to understand who you are so that you can show the people around you who he's destined you to be so that they can be who God has destined them to be listen you have got to begin to know your me you've got to you've got to catch this so in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I was here last week, but I got I to gotta connect from this to take us to where we're going. And, and I, I think, I hope that it will make sense to you. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I want you to look at verse 14 and 15 first. For the love of Christ compels us, but we judge thus, that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, that those who live should, watch, no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. We, we, just, we just live in the wrong part of the world to understand this. The love of Christ compels us, but we're, we're, we're just, we're a little bit too country cowboy mentality here and nothing nothing wrong with that but <clears throat> we know what it's like to put in a big old dip of snuff and get behind something and push it we we know how to push things we know how to push people we live in a tough part of the country we watch this stuff on the news y'all are just like me you watch this stuff on the news and somebody's coming and slapping somebody or taking their hat off and you're like Pfft. I may lose, but you ain't taking my hat off. We're going to roll. Because we, we like tough things. But you have to remove that when you read this verse. The love of Christ compels, but not from behind. That's not compelling. The love of Christ compels from in front. Whoa, you're so much better than do not go. You do not. Don't you dare tell you something my baby girl's home from tech she sends me a picture of some country podunk dirt having cowboy that she's falling in love with I'm going to love it <laughs> and me and that cowboy are gonna talk I'll tie him up to my truck and drag him back here I don't care because the love of her dad I mean this compels her to say don't you dare lower your standards she told me the other day on the phone dad I'm not even sure he exists because the guy I got in mind man he's a man of God I'm on the other side of the phone going yes. and then she says this and dad he's also fine I like pretty grandbabies. I want pretty babies too. He better be. Hey, I, I'm mean with every ounce of my being. 
If he's anything less than that, he's going to have to over my dead body marry my baby girl. Because the love of her dad compels her. No, baby, you're worth more than that. Don't you settle. Don't you give in. Don't you. I know I have raised you your whole life to believe in who you are. I don't care what the world around you says. I don't care if the world around you ridicules you for being this. I don't care what, I don't care. This is who you are. And I'm not willing to let her settle. And the love of her father compels her from in front of her. I don't go behind her going, don't date him, girl, what's wrong? I don't kick her. I'll never kick her. Because even though I'm greatly flawed, in one area man I know I'm a good dad I love that kid and I would bleed out for her and my love is in front of her compelling her to this place don't you settle he's out there he may be a, he may be in some other country but God's the crosser of the past at the right point at the right time got to put you and him together and things will be good and when I meet him People were like, you're going to be okay with that? You kidding me? I've been praying for that guy for 20 years. Yes, I'll be okay. I want it to be great. And I want everything about their marriage to be great. I want them to make a great living. I want them to have great sex. I want everything about their life to be great. That's my baby girl. I want the best for her. Why is it that we can understand that? And we can't understand when it comes to us, me individually that the love of the Father compels me from in front going, come on, come on, lead that family this way. I got something better. I know you're struggling in that job. I got something better. I know you're struggling at home. I got something better. Come on. But what do we do? As soon as the hard times come, we resist. And we run exactly in the opposite direction. So I said all that to to say this to you. What voice? you listen to because if you don't know the voice of God you don't know what it means to be compelled by God and by the way it's impossible if you know him as your savior to not know his voice the Bible's clear my sheep know my voice you may not have tuned your ears in as to how to hear him clearly but what you do is you gravitate towards the things of God instead of away from the things of God that's how you make things better and better and better so now then I want you to I want you to see this he he loves you watch this church he loves you right where you are but too much to leave you there. So stop settling for that. He loves you. He's so in love with you. He'll meet you right where you are. But don't you dare try to shrink his deity, his godness, his sovereignness. He doesn't want to leave you there. Where he meets you is in broken places, but that's not his plan for you. His plan is to take you to what he has destined for you. And he wants to lead you, not push you. So why does this happen? Well, watch this. Because we get offended. We experience pain. Well, she hurt my feelings. He did this. Can you believe what that preacher said? I'm going to say stupid things. If your walk with God is hung up on what I said or did or didn't do, you're in trouble because I'm going to fail you. I'm a knucklehead. But I'm a righteous knucklehead. I may say something dumb, but once I recognize I said something dumb, I'll go back and repent of it and tell you the right stuff. I'll get to the right stuff. But don't base your faith on me or somebody else. You've got to walk with God. But we get offended, and offense has so many different... Offense looks like pain. Offense looks like hurt. Offense looks like frustration. Offense looks like disappointment. Offense looks like doubt. Offense looks like fear. Offense looks like poverty. Offense looks like sickness. All those places we just left. So don't go back there. Don't go back there. John the Baptist, Jesus said about John the Baptist, he said, listen to me. There's never been a greater man ever to walk the earth than John the Baptist. That's what Jesus said about him. And then you know what Jesus said about John right before he died? 
John, because you love me, you're about to have your head taken off, literally. But blessed is he who is not offended because of me. You haven't paid that price. I don't care what you've been through. You haven't paid that price. You haven't ever had anybody put a sword to your head and say, I'm going to take your head off if you don't relinquish your faith in God. I had a a wise man come in here one time and I was talking to him about pastors and how we're stinking. We're like, this is our people and don't get our people. And Hey, let me tell you something. This church is a part of the body of Christ just like that church across the street and that church across the street and they're my brothers and sisters and they're my brothers and sisters and we ought to be celebrating each other and running to each other and trying to help each other and not building our own little private clubs trying to hide from each other. And anybody that wants to promote that place of divisiveness is not following God. They're not following God's plan. So, we walk out of these places of offense because these places of offense, hear me say this, and you're going you're gonna to see some of this where it's happened in your life. And you're also going to see it where it's happened in people that you know's life. What does an offense do? Here's what it does. It causes you to separate. I'm not going to listen to that. I'm, gonna, I'm not going. I'm not going to stay there. I'm not going to be talked to like that. I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm going to, because they hurt my, and it's all, you got me in the driver's seat, and you got, you're focusing on the wrong things. Offense is always going to cause you to separate from the body of Christ. Always. So we remove that because, now then this verse, 2 Corinthians 17, I mean 517, 2 Corinthians 517, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, He is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You see, what we just did in that water with Julian is nothing changed. Julian, if he wouldn't have gotten the water, he's still going to go to heaven because he accepted Christ. But what he did in that water was not just a symbolic thing. It was symbolic, but it's more than that. Julian said, hey, I want to follow God in my life. I'm not resisting you. Your ways have become my ways. You tell me to get baptized, I'll get baptized. And I want, to, I want you to lead me. And that's what this is talking about. We, we, we become new, a new creation. So then, in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, I would say this. We have to, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, recognize that we're a new creation and that all things are whole. We have to so in order to do that we have to get 2 Corinthians 5.20 now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us we implore you on Christ's behalf be reconciled to God church that's your message that's your life message you do these things I'm going to follow your will I'm going to follow your way and what you've signed up for Julian is to be an ambassador of Christ. That means you relinquish your message for life and you pick up his and you follow his. And then life for Julian and me and you, our life mission then is to tell people, oh my gosh, be be rejoined. Listen, you've got to connect to God. He's got a better plan than what you've accepted. So connect him to him. Find your place in him. As, as, as though God were pleading through you to them. So, I, I, I know there's going to have some, a little bit of difficulty in this, and that's okay. Just don't stay in it. Move out of it. Listen, what kind of ambassador are you being? Because if an ambassador loses his master's message... He's just some guy walking around. You, you've got to be an ambassador. And the way you do that is you carry his message. So that, watch, when his message comes into conflict with your message, you decide whose message wins. 
And whenever his message wins over your life message, that's when you've become the ambassador that he's destined you to be. So people say to me all the time, yeah, but I don't think I'm that guy. Well, read 2 Corinthians 5.21. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You don't get out of it. Well, it's just not the way I, 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 it's not the way I was raised. Hey, let me tell you something. Listen to me. The righteous, the righteous died for the unrighteous 2,000 years ago, and that was way before your raising. Stop letting your raising give you uh, permission to live in a broken place. Stop. Stop. It's time for us to recognize who he's made us to be so that we go and we see ourselves as the righteousness of God and we begin to go, hey, I'm the righteousness of God. I have a destiny and nothing gets to affect that. Not a difficult past, not a difficult present because I'm not going to have a difficult future because I'm the righteousness of God and that opens up doors for me that other people aren't able to walk through. As a son or a daughter, you get to walk through doors that other people don't. That's what it means to be a son and a daughter. And so I want you to start praying from this place of righteousness so you can understand that destiny really is real. And church, listen to me. Your family deserves to walk in destiny that you open the door for. You open the door of destiny. You also close it. Stop. Stop closing it. The people around you, they deserve more. So I want to I wanna end with this, per, this passage in 1 Corinthians 12, but listen to me. This is why I've done the whole series, this is me, to get to this point. So please catch this. Until you recognize who you are, you'll never, until I know me, I'll never know we. You see, I don't feel any responsibility for we as long as I continue to not recognize me. But when I start to recognize me, all of a sudden now I've got some responsibility for we. And you don't believe that? Good. I'm glad. Let's read this passage. I'm going to show you where you're wrong. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Look at verse 12. For as the body is one and has many members, but all members of that one body, being many, are one body. So also is Christ. For by one spirit, watch this church, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jew or Greek, whether slave or free, we've all been made to drink one spirit. I'm pretty sure if he covers Jew and Greek, and slave and free, I'm pretty sure he means Baptist and Methodist and charismatic and church of Christ too. Baptized into one body. The problem is we have difficulty understanding some of the scriptures. Notice who baptized into what here? Baptized by the Spirit into one body. That is not talking about the waters of baptism. That's talking about the waters of salvation. When we accepted Christ, the Holy Spirit baptized us into the body of Christ. And me and you, like it or not, we're part of the same body. Me and you are part of the very same body. So, so look what happens in this, in this place. But now, uh, let me go to verse 14. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I'm not part of the body. Is, there, is it therefore not part of the body? If the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I'm not part of the body. Is it therefore part of the body? What just happened? The foot got offended because it wasn't a hand. And so it said, go on without me. I'm not part of the body. But I'm going to ask you something. If my foot, my right foot, decides today it's not part of my body, does it cease to be part of my body? It just stops functioning like it. But it's still there. I may have to drag it around dead. 
So I'm asking you, what part of the body are you? A functioning part? Or are you just some dead weight that we're dragging around? Because when we recognize who we're called to be, then we recognize we have obligation to each other. And you don't get any say-so in that. You don't get to say, have, well, I don't like, I'm like what? I don't like their music. Okay. Don't, don't go to church with them, but you're still part of them. I don't like their preacher. Okay. Don't listen to him, but you're still part of them. Or even internally, well, I don't like kids. Okay, but what part is yours? What part is yours? So we don't get to just stop being part of the body. We're still part of the body. We just aren't functioning. So here's what I would say to you today. Listen closely. In this body, who's doing your part? Because if I've got to pick this 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 thing up that's heavy if I've got to if I've got to pick this thing up if one of my arms I, I know if one of my arms says I'm not picking up any weight but I still have to pick it up well guess what that makes for this one arm it makes it a whole lot heavier but if if both of them come together then we can work together so if one arm stops working it doesn't mean the work stops it just means one arm's got to work a whole heck of a lot harder. So, so I got to read this last, catch this. I, I'm, I'm really done after this. I'm done lying. I'm not a liar. I'm the truth of God. Here we go. Verse 17. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the smelling be? If the whole body wanted to go be with Pastor Tori in the nursery, who'd be in here with us? But if we're all in here, who's in there with Pastor Tori? There's things that we got to recognize that, hey, it's kind of out of my, okay, well, if holding babies in your jam, find what is. Because the body needs you. Verse 19, and if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now, indeed, there are many members and yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need for you. Nor again, <clears throat> the head to the feet, I have no need for you. No, no, much rather those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which think that they're less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. Nobody likes feet. That's why we buy cool shoes. That's why. I mean, Nate gets it. Nate wears cool shoes. Hey, what I'm talking about in the body. Sometimes there's jobs that aren't, aren't exciting. But we do them. We do them because we recognize we're the body. And I got to go where my feet go. And wherever my feet go, my ears go. We, we function as a body. No, much rather, these members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think are less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty. But our presentable parts have no need. For God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it. That there should watch, church. You've got to understand this isn't just me talking. Look at 25. That there should be no division in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. Worship team, would you come up? Listen. I need you to hear this. I need you to catch this closing. When you suffer, I suffer. When you celebrate, I celebrate. We all, we all get that. When we go through, when we go through really difficult things, we get that. I mean, if you've spent very much time here at all, you recognize that when you walked into the doors of this church today, someone incredibly important was missing right at the front door oh, my heart 
breaks that Art wasn't there to hug me today. But I celebrate too, because guess what? I'm going to hug him again someday. And so who then, who then takes that place? Who then takes that place? Who then fills those shoes? We hurt together, and we celebrate together, because when you hurt, I hurt. When I hurt, you hurt. Because we are a body. Church, listen to me. This whole series is about this. I got to know me so that I can then know we. We have to work. We're the body of the living Christ. There's no option for failure. If we don't take care of these kids that need to be taken care of, who's going to? What body of Christ should be all of us? And I'm not elevating us, but if you're not praying this with me as a part of this body, start today. But who is crying out for all those lost people around us right now today? Who's crying out for them? There is a community in all of the communities we come from that we have in our communities broken people. And whenever they go through broken times, they got nowhere to go. But we, we step in and we show them what it looks like. And it starts to make sense. Being the church is not an option. Being the church is an obligation. We need to be willing to sign up for it. Let's pray together. Father, as we come before you, we celebrate this day. We celebrate the amazing things that you've done. We celebrate that Julian's following you with his life. He's signed up to be a good ambassador for you. We celebrate that the kids brought these palms Sunday, these palms in here. We celebrate that 2,000 years ago, people laid palms out before you so that Jesus, you could ride into Jerusalem as the King of Kings. And then a week later, you could die on the cross to take my sicknesses and my diseases and my sin and my shame on your body to pay the complete price for me and for every one of us. Because you did those things, we don't, ha- we don't have to have an obligation. We get to have an obligation to you and to the people around us to be the body of Christ. Because the love of God compels us. Father, let us be that body. We love you. We celebrate you. We honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me? I'm going to ask the ministry team, if you guys have come here, if there's anything we can pray for, we'd love to do that. God bless you. Well, we hope that this week's message blessed you. If you want to stay up to date with things going on with the river, follow us on Facebook. But if this ministry has blessed you and you would like to sow into it, there's a couple ways to do that. One is you can download our River app, which is available on the iTunes Store and the Google Play Store. Or you can go to our website, www.theriverpanhandle.com, and give that way.